The end of the year is upon us, so we're gonna be doing a little progress report here. I hope you guys had a chance to check out my interview from last week with Peter Bogosian. For those of you that might have missed it, my intention with Peter was to focus on atheism as well as critical thinking. These are ideas that Peter wrote his book about, spends most of his time talking about, and are obviously topics that I'm interested in. I think I had about 13 questions prepared for Peter, but like many of my interviews, the conversation pretty much just took a life of its own. In last week's case, though, something particularly interesting happened. No matter how far I tried to steer the conversation away from the regressive left, and I tried many times, all roads kept leading back to them. I've mentioned to you guys a couple times now how I want to talk about all kinds of things on this show, from science to politics to spirituality and much more. I've also mentioned to you guys how I don't want to solely focus on the regressive left, primarily because it doesn't necessarily solve anything. Still, I find myself incredibly torn about this topic. On one hand, until the last couple months, we hadn't even diagnosed the problem of the regressive left, right? Clearly, huge numbers of those of you on the left were upset about how your team was being hijacked, but there wasn't a place to come together and talk about it, much less a whole group of like-minded people willing to share their experiences and tell their stories. For that reason, I've wanted to keep this conversation going. It's important to realize how many of us are actually out there. There are a lot. We want to fix the left, but I don't think we can without getting to critical mass on the issue. On the other hand, I don't sense that we can actually change these regressives. As I've also mentioned before, since we've started doing the show, I've seen these guys continue to lie and smear opponents only to be caught and then double down or even more. Some people are fighting back against these lies with facts and logic. Uh, fortunately, I've had several of these people on the show, like Majid Nawaz, Sarah Hader, and Gad Sad. Others I know only from the online space, such as my guest this week, Ali Rizvi. Ali's an atheist Muslim who's constantly writing about and fighting against regressive ideology. Growing up mainly in Saudi Arabia and ultimately leaving religion for secularism, he should be a natural hero of the left. Sadly, he's not. Uh, that's one of the many things that we're going to talk about. I go back and forth between thinking that fighting the regressives by putting time and energy into discussing them is what will ultimately do the most to change the landscape of the left, and then just thinking that if we ignore them, maybe they'll go away. I tend to think that most of you will tell me that we have to keep amplifying real liberal voices, and that by ignoring them, we'll only let their influence grow. That's pretty much what I think, too. I must say that I'm incredibly inspired by the fact that half the time when I see anything that they write, tweet, or whatever, there's an army of people ready to combat their bullshit. A few people have mentioned to me that they believe that this whole regressive situation and the fuel that it gives to the right is only gonna get worse before it gets better. Unfortunately, I think these people are probably correct. Until the real, legitimate, true voices of liberalism can come back to the forefront, this conversation is always going to be stuck between the regressives and the Trumps. It looks like we've got our work cut out for us for 2016. My guest this week is Ali Rizvi. Ali writes for the Huffington Post, and his first book, The Atheist Muslim, Losing My Religion But Not My Identity, is being published in 2016. He's a strong advocate for the advancement of secularism and science, particularly in the Muslim world. Ali, welcome to the show. Hey, Dave. Glad to be on. So we've been doing this, as I start almost all my shows by saying to the guests, we've been doing this on Twitter for a while, and you are another one of these anti-regressive warriors, so I'm happy that you're joining me this week. Yeah, you can't, you can't help but be. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> you're doing anything like this, it's almost synonymous. Yeah, it, it yeah. absolutely is. So, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the regressives, of course, but let's, let's talk about you first. I want people to understand sort of who you are, where you come from. Uh, you spent most of your youth, up until your early teens, in Saudi Arabia, is that right? Right, I did. So I, I pretty much grew up there. I was born in uh, Pakistan, and then after that we moved to Tripoli in Libya. I lived there for several years. And then I went to um, Saudi Arabia, where I was actually until high school. And then after that I went back to Pakistan again for um, university, and then I came to Canada. Yeah, so why, why were you bouncing around so much? My parents are professors, and they um, liked going to different places, and they, they you know, they got really good job offers are both very, very competent. And uh, so they traveled all over the place. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the, those are just the countries we lived in. And you know, we used to visit all over the place. So just generally, when it comes to North Africa and the Middle East and South Asia, seen a lot of places growing yeah. up. 
Well, interestingly, all three of those, particularly Pakistan and Libya, are probably extremely different now than they were when you were there. Right. I, in Libya, I, I don't have too many. I, I mean, I, the, when we lived there, when I lived there, I was a kid. So I, don't ha I, I do have strong memories of it, but uh, they're probably not representative at all of uh, the way it is right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, Pakistan's also very different uh, than it used to be, and I haven't been there for a while. Now I can't go there. Right. So uh, we'll talk about why you can't go there in a little bit. Uh, but let's talk about Saudi Arabia for a bit, because it's such an important player in world politics and its relationship right. to the United States. And I feel like people actually know very little about Saudi Arabia, the nature of our relationship. What was it like growing up there? Uh, your parents as professors obviously came from the, I'm assuming that was middle class, sort of educated middle class. Well, how did that relate to in religion and secularism and all that it was um it was it, it was complicated so like you know the way i describe it is that my own nuclear family like my parents and my siblings are sort of a, a liberal progressive type of shia muslim family and uh, so we had that and then outside that i was in uh, the a private american school the american international school in riyadh at the time so the school was you know, obviously it was American, so we had American textbooks, we just listened to American music, and, uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it was an American school that had people from about 80 different nationalities there. So it was a truly international school. Um, and then the, um, outside of that, when we stepped out of that, it was, you know, cover your hair, women can't drive, um, you know, five times prayer, and if you're outside during the prayer, you know, you'll get caught by one of the um, matawa, as they call them, which is the religious police. So it was strange seeing, you know, all of these three things. But when, you know, when you're growing up with something as a kid, that is normal for you. That's what you think everything's like. So I actually think that it was a good thing to be exposed to all of those worlds um, at the same time. Um, yeah. So I was, uh, you know, when, for instance, when 9-11 happened, uh, I could, you know, this was the Saudis coming in from there, and I, I remember the mentality that there was there. One one thing I described in my book is uh, when I was in fifth grade at the American school, we'd made paper snowflakes out of, um, you know, you fold up a piece of paper, you cut snowflakes and sure. stuff. Um, and, you know, we decorated them with glue and glitter and our names, and we were happy. I was about 10 years old. And uh, it was, even though it was an American school, the, the Saudi Ministry of Education used to send an inspector once in a while uh, to make sure everything's okay, everything's going according to the rules. Mm -hmm. And he came in and he actually cut one of the tips off of each of the snowflakes. He was very angry, he cut them off, and we asked our teacher what was going on. He's like, you know, what is this? And then she told us about the Star of David and why we can't have anything that has six points that sort of symbolizes huh. that. And that was our, this is a whole class of 10 year olds, that was our introduction, at least my introduction, to the Jews. Wow. Right. So, um, and this was just a spot check from an inspector. But there are kids in Saudi Arabia who go to the Saudi schools. They have the stuff in their textbooks. The guy who did that spot check for us was actually, he actually writes the curriculum for the rest of them. So when 9 11 happened, I saw that kind of culture, those people coming in uh, from there. And then the people in my school, like the Americans, um, they're the ones being attacked over here. It was, it was really strange seeing it because I'd kind of grown up with both sides in parallel. You know, the, uh, all my teachers were American. A lot of my friends were from the U.S. and Canada. And on the other hand, the country I was living in was a place where all the hijackers came from. So at fifth grade, so you're probably, I guess that's about 11 years old or so, um, was that sort of where your secular awakening was was happening? Is that the time of that? Or how religious actually was was your family? Were you were you guys away from it already? Or break that down for me. Well, my family was uh, my family was sort of liberal uh, religious. I mean, they were Muslim. Uh, they were believing Muslims. We used to go through the uh, you know we did the Ramadan thing. We used to we're Shia, so we used to do the Muharram morning. Uh, my parents used to pray you know on and off. Usually they made it to like two or three times a day, you know, on average. Um, so, you know, there were... There, there must be an interesting diagram of people praying and then the sort of drop off as it gets later in the day, right? There is, I, I don't know a lot of um, Muslims who actually fully pray five times a day. Every time I watch TV and uh, it's, 
you know, this is a slight tangent, but every time, you know, you Google North American Muslim or American Muslim, you'll get a whole picture of people with head scarves and, you know, people in mosques and so on. But they're just as misrepresentative of U.S. Muslims as, uh, as you know, any militant group. Right, it's right. It's not what care and isna are not. What Which is exactly why we should all be talking to people like you more, because I have no faith that the media is giving us examples of, of any, forget religion, ethnicity, whatever it is. The media gives us such bad examples of everybody that that's why we have to talk to the outliers, right? I mean, you, you understand it in a way, and I'm sorry we're going away from your original question. That's fine, that's fine. Um, yeah, I understand it in a way because, you know, for instance, if there's something, some story relating to Christianity, you're not exactly, you're usually going to call in a pastor or, you know, somebody who's a, who's a, a priest or something like that, who's an expert in Christianity. But um, the thing with Muslims is it's different. When you think Jerry Seinfeld or David Letterman, you don't think Jew, right? <laughs> but with Right. Well, I don't think Letterman's Jewish, but <laughs> either way. I thought he was. He's a, a comedian, so it's, it's close enough. Comedian is a whole different, that's a separate, <laughs> I think. Right. Yeah, that's, that's another thing. Right. Uh, but, but um, you know, when you, when, when it comes to Muslims, I mean, Dave Chappelle, Dr. Oz, Shaq O'Neal, like all of these guys, I mean, these are people who uh, are Muslims, but that's not um, who you said, that that's not the representation, even though they're right here in front of our faces. So when, when you see it on TV, it's always the one with the headscarf. And every, almost every non-Muslim I know who works with a Muslim at work has gone for a beer with them afterwards. You know, a lot, a lot of people have dated Muslim girls, and they've very few of them actually wear the headscarf. But I'm pretty no, sure if uh, if Shaq was uh, the main representative for Muslims, things would be extremely different right now. Different, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably for the better. Um, yeah. So wait, so tell me, so a little more. So your family, so you guys were sort of religious, but not that religious. You were getting some of this at, at the school, but that was obviously Americanized. Uh, right. Keep going. So I mean, my uh, my main the first time I was truly skeptical of uh, religion and God was when I was five years old. And I actually had a cousin, and uh, she was three, and this is, uh, she lived in London, and uh, she had childhood leukemia. So, you know, she was close to my age. I was five, she was three, you know, we were playmates. And uh, when she was dying, everybody came into the room. So this was like in, our, in the culture, you know, last moments, everybody walks in, some kids were there, everybody was there. And uh, it's uh, if you know what a child's death is, especially from cancer, it's absolutely horrific. You know, so cancer doesn't discriminate. Same amount of pain an adult feels is what a three-year-old child would feel. So, and at that time, there wasn't really any good cure for childhood uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia either. So at that point, my mother and my aunt uh, were praying and crying. And I was standing there with my father and I asked my father, I'm like, you know, what's going on? And I was watching her in pain. And he said that uh, God's taking her back. You know, God's taking her to a better place and keeping her with him. So I'm thinking, okay, that's, that's not such a bad thing. So why are they crying and why are they praying so hard? And they're like, they're, they're begging God not to take her away. Mm -hmm. They want him to, you know, like stop the pain or not take her away. And, and to me, like in my mind, we used to play tug of war in school. So I was thinking of the tug of war game where there's this God who's all powerful apparently and we're on the other end. And we're playing, and it just seemed like a very sadistic um, thing to do. Yeah, yeah. It, it also it also sounds like such a losing proposition if if you're the believer. So if in this case you're, you're your father, assuming he was a believer, or or that maybe he was just playing the role as a father. But it's a losing proposition if you pretty much know medically that the child is not going to make it, and yet you have these people praying, and you know the outcome is pretty much in front. What are you actually saying about prayer is also an interesting angle. I mean, that's the other thing. And I'm thinking if, if God is like all powerful and there's a three-year-old kid in pain, you don't, and fine, I understand, you know, you have to take the kid back. Then don't, like, don't draw it out. Don't draw out the agony because uh, cancer deaths are terrible. Yeah, so yeah. we, you know, at that point, uh, it was the clarity of a five-year-old mind. I obviously that I remember this very clearly. It's one of my earliest, strongest memories just because of the intensity of it. And after that, I thought, I was like, okay, nobody's really going to be happy with this God character anymore. But the next week, every ritual, everything, God he was a hero. You know, everybody was continued praying to him. So it didn't make a lot of sense to me. And then after that, I thought, I was like, maybe, well, all these guys, you know, all the adults, grown-ups think it makes sense. Or maybe I'm the one who's crazy. But then I'd see, I'd watch TV and 
there'd be a, a disaster, natural disaster, a tornado or a, or a flood or something, and the lone survivor or two would say, you know, I'm God bless, you know, God save me. I'm so thankful to God. And I was, I'd always think, you know, what did the other people do? So as a kid, it was always there. And then I dabbled in and out of being religious to some extent, like whenever I had exams, finals. That when I was <laughs> That's when the different. prayer would kick in? Yeah, so it was, it was like my cousin used to call it bribing God. He's yeah. like, you're bribing God. He was a very religious guy. Yeah. Uh, did but, God, God probably took your bribes. I'm guessing you were a pretty good student. He, yeah, it, it turned out that uh, I was fairly, yeah I, yeah, I did well in school. I, I did, it turned out whether I prayed or not, God somehow was okay with me, but all those kids with HIV in Africa. Somehow. Yeah, just somehow my grades were okay, but HIV for the kids in Africa, not so much. Yeah. All right, so you, you have this awakening and, it, and it's happening. Where, where was the full sort of more adult version of your awakening. Were you still in Saudi Arabia or was that uh, when you had left already? I had, I had, I had left. I had gone, I'd gone to medical school at that point in Pakistan. I'd, I'd finished, I'd completed it. And uh, towards the end of it, I had uh, actually really started reading um, the, uh, well, I'd started reading the scripture and everything, the Quran, when I was much younger. But I think when the internet came around and I wanted to do more research. I was able to find more things. So I, this was around 99 or something. I was already in my 20s. And, you know, I, 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 I'm a little up there. Yeah. So, yeah. so I started, uh, you know, when I actually started reading it and, and when people got more and more defensive about it, the more I talked, especially in Pakistan, when you talk to people, they give you all of these responses. Like, you know, those aren't true Muslims or, you know, this is, it's a religion of peace or, you know, that, that thing that you're quoting from the Quran that's just mistranslated or misinterpreted or it's a metaphor or, you know, whatever the excuse was. And eventually I started seeing through it. And then I, I think it was actually one day when it hit me. I'm like, this, I shouldn't even be considering this. I mean, this is a guy lived inside a fish. You know, there's, you know, when... Yeah, it says it says in it. I, I'd hear the you know the, the in the Quran. Uh, the, for me, it was a Quran. For a lot of people, it's a Bible and everything. But the, and by the way, we should note that they're all they're, equally crazy. There's plenty of evil stuff in all of them. We oh, want yeah, you know right. we want to be good liberals here, so let's not pile on one. Right? There's plenty of awful stuff in the Old Testament. Well, I for mean, sure. I, I always say that if uh, Moses hadn't uh, hallucinated up the Old Testament, then you know Muhammad couldn't have plagiarized it. <laughs> that's it is, and then there's a lot of similarities. You know, there's a no pork, uh, there's no foreskin for miles. There's uh, shalom and salam, and then both of their nicknames are Mo. It's <laughs> in a way there's a you know there are a lot of similarities between, especially between Judaism and Islam, and and the violence in the books is absolutely. I mean that's that's an obvious thing. But I used to think of like, what are you doing when people would quote verse uh, 434, which says that you can beat your wife if you fear disobedience as a last resort. And they justify it. And they're like, well, no, it actually means this, or it's only as a last resort. And I used to think, I'm like, if I had written this in my book, and the book came out last week, you guys would be killing me for this. I mean, there's the, the word, you wouldn't be looking for context. You wouldn't be looking at alternative interpretations. That's a luxury that we only afford to holy books. I mean, we don't read Alice in Wonderland that way. Right, right. Actually, you know, the... And the you know people like for example Raza Aslan and so on would be like, you know, this is this is we should not read this literally. Like and the worst thing is the people who read it literally. I was actually on on a show. I was on uh, the agenda with Steve Pakin here in Toronto, and uh, I was sitting next to Shabir Ali, who's a, an Islamic scholar. And uh, at one point he actually said he's like, look, people misquote the Quran by quoting it literally. And I was just thinking that's the, that was one of the most amazing sentences. I've that's ever. a great quote right there. Yeah, he's a great guy, but he said it. And I used to think, I'm like, I understand why they're so terrified of people quoting it literally, any scripture <laughs> literally, because it's terrifying if you quote, if you quote those words exactly the way that they're written or exactly the way they were said by God, apparently, uh, then it's a terrifying thing. You know, so they say, well, you have to look at the interpreters and the scholars and then you listen to the scholars, and they're saying these human beings, their explanations of what's God, what God's word is right, right. actually means more than what God's word is itself, which, again, doesn't make any sense. And ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and 
um, these are these people. They're not quoting scholars. I mean, they're they're quoting the scripture. They're quoting the hadith. Yeah, you know, uh, after the Paris attacks, I, I got into it on Twitter with one of my one of my friends on the left, who right. immediately was you know with, within while the thing I think while the event was still happening, so literally they hadn't caught anybody yet. I mean, there were bodies still on the floor at the theater. He immediately went to the American foreign policy stuff. And then a few minutes after that, they released, the guys who did it, ISIS actually released the statement, and there was a ton of scripture in there. And I said, well, what, what do you think about this? And then the conversation sort of dwindled off into nothing. And, yeah. I, and I think that's part of what this whole schism here on the left that we've been talking so much about is, is related to. You know, like, it's scripture, it's written word that somebody is believing and taking into action. And then also, there's a lot of messed up foreign policy stuff by every country in the world. Yeah, I, I always find it, I find it interesting that whenever I'm, I'm debating or I'm having a discussion with anybody, usually if it's uh, someone who's moderate or someone, uh, or an academic or, or um, someone else in Islamic studies, for instance, um, they don't want to talk about the scripture. They're like, well, come on, let's, let's not talk about the scripture, as if it's sort of beneath them. It's like, you know, we're going to talk about the sociological implications of this, you know, how does religion work, how does Id identity formation and all of these other things, economics and so on. But whenever I talk to a a guy with a beard, you know, someone who's more of a fundamentalist. And I, like at times, I'll say, and I said this on the show to Shabir Ali too, I was like, oh, let's not get into the whole scripture thing. But they almost always turn around and say, no, that's what's important. That's what the religion is. So the people who are actually believing it and going along with um, the tenets of it and actually following the example of the prophet and so on, these are people who actually take scripture very, very seriously. Uh, the rest of the people don't, and I think um, it's because there is an element of rationality in them. They just can't believe. They're like, okay, this is a book, but nobody really believes this. Yeah, so last week my guest was Peter Boghossian, who you're probably familiar with, and he oh. wrote a book called A Manual for Creating Atheists. And one of the things that I thought was most interesting about it was that he basically said, you know, because these beliefs are not based in critical thinking or rationality, and that people have to take this leap of faith, that actually if you can really sit someone down and you do it sort of with the right intent and, and a clear mind, you can start pulling the, the underpinnings away in an effective way and you can actually convert people in, into free thinkers. Uh, I'm gonna guess that you've done quite a bit of that yourself. I, I've, the, the only reason I do what I do, Dave, is uh, because of that. Anytime somebody tells me, it's like, you know, the way that you talk to people, it's not gonna work, people aren't gonna change their mind, um, that is absolutely not true. And I've got, um, you know, if you, if you look at my inbox, like my email inbox, like almost on a daily basis, you know, I get messages. I mean, the most recent one was, I don't know if you read that post that went viral. It was by a friend of mine, Simi Rahman. She wrote about the de telling the difference between a moderate and a radical. She lives in California. She's a pediatrician. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. So, yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, and she... Um, so it went viral, got thousands and thousands of shares and so on. And uh, she got a message uh, just a few days ago. And there was this uh, woman who actually wore the niqab. It was a very conservative family. And, and she'd read it. And um, she has now she's seriously thinking about taking it off. Like wow. that has completely shaken the way that she used to think about things, the way that she grew up. And these are stories that I hear every day. And I hear them more than ever in... Um, Muslim majority countries, and and this is what's so interesting is that in North America generally the the Muslims because they're they're used to uh, the free speech and the open discourse and everything uh, they are they like to have a respectful approach they're like okay criticize religion but at least be respectful of us they don't like the tone that somebody like for example like Richard Dawkins or Bill Maher takes right however in the Muslim in these Muslim majority countries. Where they're living under these sort of uh, theocratic dictatorships, even though they're not officially theocratic dictatorships, almost all of them are. Um, for them, they that really resonates with them, with them, the with the more aggressive tone because they're oppressed by it. They can't speak, so they're angry, they're frustrated. The last person that they heard who spoke went out and he got hacked to death in in Dhaka and yeah. In uh, so, you know, they they are they're angry and they're frustrated and. They, they want that kind of tone. They, they feel like the respectful discourse is the luxury of the privileged people who are able to 
uh, who have values like freedom of speech and who can take that who take that for granted that that i mean that's really fascinating because you know i've talked a lot about how people you know especially it's Dawkins and Marr are the two that have sort of become you know the most outspoken on atheism really and and talking about the doctrine of islam i i think they're pretty both they're, pretty clear it's out there in the muslim majority countries so yeah but Lots i what i think what i think is interesting here is that i hear from atheists will say, well, Dawkins and Marr, they're, they're too offensive, you know, it's too offensive. They're being, you know, they're putting out too much and they're not speaking in a, you know, a friendly way. So atheists are angry at them for, yeah. for being yeah. atheists. But interestingly, you're saying that in foreign places, in foreign countries, they need to hear it in that light. And that's incredible. Yeah, because they actually want to say it that way. I mean, if you, the most um, sort of aggressive sounding atheists uh, that, that you'll meet uh, from the Muslim world are the ones who actually grew up there. Yeah. You know, the ones with the accents are the ones who made it here after living there who think that all, you know, Americans kind of take freedom of speech and polite discourse and so on uh, for granted. So they, they are angry. They want a more angry sort of uh, um, expression of it. But there, I mean, there is a point. I do understand why people, uh, different things work on different people. I always give the example of the civil rights movement, how, you know, Rosa Parks, acted in silence you know she was sitting on the on the bus and she said i'm not going to move back on the other hand martin luther king was the diplomat you know so he was um he, he was sort of more political he was conciliatory he used to try to make uh, reasoned arguments and talk to the other side on the other hand you had malcolm x who was uh, more militant and all of those approaches had uh, had a role that a very key role and, and they work on different people um my approach is probably more sort of, uh, I, I try to be reasonable. I have my make reasonable arguments. I, I try to do that at least. Um, but um, I do appreciate people who do the kind of thing that Bill Maher and Richard Dawkins do because I know that it resonates. I know that it's, uh, um, it's very satisfying to a lot of people growing up there. And I remember when I was growing up there, whenever I would hear uh, people say things like that, and it was George Carlin at the time. <laughs> You know, I, um, I remember, you know, seeing little things that George Carlin had done and the, the way that he talked about religion. It was just so in your face and so, like, nakedly open, his yeah. criticism of it, that it was extremely satisfying to watch. But that's something that you could not see. And, and you'd, you'd show it to your friends. It was on a VHS tape. And you'd show it to your friends and then, you know, a little clip where you said it. And yeah. Yeah. You see the shock on their faces, and it was, it was there was just something really satisfying about it. Yeah, well, I, I tell my friend Kelly Carlin, who's been on the show, who's George's daughter, I, I, I tell Kelly literally once a week I'll call her or text her and say, God, God, ironically, I'll say, gosh, you know, I really wish that your dad was around now because we're so trapped, and I think this will get us to the next portion of this conversation, but we're so trapped in this PC world right now, and we're right. so afraid of language, and we're so afraid of offending everybody, and already, as you've said, sometimes you have to offend people to actually break through. It's not your style, clearly, right? Like, you're not looking to I'm offend not. everybody, but... Yeah, I end up doing it anyway. I think that the nature of the topic <laughs> right. is... But you, you know, the, the thing is... Um, like, I, I hear this a lot. I hear a lot of people say this, especially uh, a lot of my Muslim friends in here living in the U.S. and in Canada, is that um, the free freedom of speech does not mean the freedom of, to offend. And I always say to them, I'm like, there's no such thing as freedom of speech without the freedom to offend. Yeah. Yeah. Every, there is absolutely no major revolutionary change that has ever happened in history that did not piss off a lot of people. So let's talk a little bit about our friends on the left, because uh, I think they've, they've failed us, but particularly you and, and your friends and family, probably, in, in this regard. They have somehow aligned themselves with forces that don't want you to speak up against doctrine. And, and that's really incredible. It's the reverse of liberalism. And I'll mm. let you take it from there. Well, I mean, that, that's what I think. I think if you're against bad ideas, you should be against bad ideas anywhere. If you oppose homophobia and you think homophobia is a terrible thing, it should be a bad thing. And you, you know, you point it out every time it's you know, someone quotes the Bible, or every time it's in a Donald Trump speech, <laughs> um, you know, or a Ted Cruz speech or whatever it is. Then it, that same idea is also a bad idea when it's in the Quran and if it's being said by Muslims, including a lot of liberal Muslims. I mean, that is something that even a lot of liberal Muslims in North America haven't warmed up to yet. Mm -hmm. So. These, um, 
I understand, like, there's the, I think there's this uh, uh, instinct to try and protect the minority. Uh, but the ideology that the minority here subscribes to just coincidentally, and I'm not saying that they follow it the same way that uh, they do in other more violent parts of the world, but that same ideology, the same book, is being used to um, kill people, right, and to throw gay people off rooftops um, in other parts of the world. So I think it is it is very confusing for everybody because, uh, you know, the, the way that it happens is, you know, people see here, especially non-Muslims, they see on TV, they see a group called the Islamic State quoting the Quran accurately and actually saying, quoting verses that say, fight the disbelievers and charge them, you know, the non-Muslim tax and, you know, God will destroy them and so on. So they're quoting these verses. Uh, they're saying Allahu Akbar, right? So they're, de they're obviously professing their faith and then they're chopping someone's heads off or throwing somebody off a rooftop. And the reaction over here, uh, often when they see that, is that they immediately jump to defending the faith, that mm -hmm. this is the real faith. And the moment they say that, you know, you bring the scripture to them. You're like, well, what about this verse they quoted, just like you did with your friend? You know, what about this verse that they quoted? It's, this says exactly the words that they said here match the action. And then they start defending the verses and the book, uh, you know, misinterpretation, out of context, and so on. All the, you know, that's sort of the excuses that you hear. Yeah. And yeah. so now what you have is you have moderate Muslims here um, defending the same book that the fundamentalists over there are quoting and citing to kill non-Muslims over there that the non-Muslims are looking at from this side of the world. And that is toxic because it actually... Uh, makes that gives the impression that the moderate Muslims over here are pretty much they, they subscribe to the same ideology. They're just not acting on it, which is not true. But right. that's the impression it gives. Not only is it not true, but it, it seems to me that people like you, people like Majid Nuaz, Sarah Hader, great people in, in my estimation, who I think are fighting for the right things, who are applying the same principles across the board. They're not looking at your faith or your race or your nationality. They're saying here are humanistic principles, right, that I want to apply to everyone. The left is the one attacking them. Did you ever expect that that was gonna be the pushback for you? Um, it, it, for me, I, no, I didn't. <laughs> it's, it, I, honestly, well, I mean, I knew that there were a lot of uh, sort of moderate Muslims that would have problems with it. I just didn't think that, uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of the C.J. Whirlmans and the, you know, uh, I guess, you know, whatever we call the regressive left, um, they, uh, I can't keep track of all of them. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah so I, this is just the one from most recent memory. You don't keep but, a list on the side of your bed. I have a chalkboard and I'm just always adding to the list. You don't have that? I, I can't. I have I have better things to do. I don't have enough uh, time or crayons to explain <laughs> the regressive left. I am spending a fortune in chalk. It's ridiculous. <laughs> no, but the the thing with the regressive left, and on a serious note, is they're they're reacting to you know the pushback that we're getting is a reaction, and uh, for them, I I just look at that entire thing as a very very reactionary thing. Their only argument, the only argument they have to anything is bigot, Islamophobe, house Muslim, or uh, you know the brown skinned white. I I don't know what what it was. Yeah, it's a lot of that. Yeah. So, there's that, that that's the only argument that they have and I, I I'm actually encouraged I'm optimistic about it I mean if you looked at in, in the past every time uh, one of these attacks happened and there was some conversation to be t t taking place on TV about it some on on CNN or MSNBC or Fox or anything it would always be that Reza Aslan who'd come on or they'd call you know uh, the comedian guy uh, on CNN uh, Dean Obadala. So him and so they would, you know, they that that's what they would do. But now I'm not seeing that. So, you know, since um, these uh, new attacks and now that everything is getting even more serious, you know, I'm seeing uh, more of Majid on TV. I'm seeing more of Asra Namani on TV. Um, you know, I'm seeing voices like this. I'm seeing Ayan Hirsi Ali being called on to talk about things. So I, I think that most of the uh, that even the so-called mainstream media is seeing through it. Uh, Bill Maher actually said on, on the last show that he was on, or, or the one with Asa Namani when he interviewed her, uh, he actually said that uh, he's more and more liberals are coming up to him and agreeing with him. They used to get a lot of crap from him before.
or he doesn't anymore. Um, and I think that that's changing. And I think that this whole, that what we call the regressive left is simply responding to that. Well, I gotta tell you, I mean, that sounds incredibly uplifting because, you know, I'm, I'm so in this and having these conversations. And as I said at the top of the show, I, I find a lot of it exhausting. And I battle sort of between back and forth of like, can I move on from this topic? And every time I move on, I feel like I get sucked back in. And you know, I'll, I'll put it away, and then I'll suddenly see your, your Twitter fight with someone, or I'll see you know, Greenwald attacking Sam, or whatever it is. But I think you gave me a little something to go with there, because the idea that they are acting out more, it's getting more like a, a child having a tantrum, and maybe it's just because they realize this is the last vestige of an ideology that's just not gonna work because we've woke up, right? Yeah, I, th I think that they're, they're prodding basically for a response. Um, and, and we give it to them, you know, in all honesty, a lot of times, I mean, I'll ignore it for a while, and I, and I, I uh, you know, like with, um, I'll ignore it for a very long time, but if I do decide to respond, I decide to respond strong, and usually the response is not for the person making it, it's for the rest of the audience, for everybody else who's watching the conversation. I mean, I, I'm under no illusions that I can, I can change the minds of, uh, you know, a lot of these sort of hacks on, uh, that, that are a lot of the trolls that actually try to, you know, dissuade us and try to deflect everything. But um, I think that uh, for the wider audience who's seeing the conversations, it's good for them to see what they're, what they're dealing with, to see both sides of it and to see that play out you know, on whether on social media or in books or in articles and so on. So I, I think that, you know, the, you know, I'll give you, I, I, I think that they're reacting to, for instance, with Sam Harris, you know, Sam Harris has a lot of great ideas. He started a lot of really good conversations. In fact, everything that we're seeing right now uh, with the rise of Donald Trump and sort of the hijacking of this conversation by the sort of the, the xenophobic, paranoid side, mm -hmm. um, and now them gaining ground and capitalizing on on the on, on the fear and the concern and the confusion that everybody's feeling, um, something that the left should have done, uh, but they didn't do, right? And they should have done it from a sort of a moral, uh, honest uh, position. And, and now it's being done by the right from a xenophobic, bigoted position. Um, and this is something that Sam predicted a long time ago. He wrote about it, um, and now uh, I I think you know what's happening is that you know there's all of these spats back and forth with the Greenwalds and the Whirlmans and you know all of these other sort of characters, and they're deflecting from what was initially the the actual thing that was causing this response in the first place. Right. So, right. So what the uh, go, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just saying we should continue. What, exactly what we were doing before is what we should be doing. We should just be talking about the ideas, um, sticking to the big picture. I mean, I came from when I when I came here um, to Canada and to the U.S. after living for you know 24 years and in, in Muslim majority countries, I wanted to bring. I wanted to talk about big ideas. You know, I, I wasn't really concerned about. Uh, microaggressions or, you know, <laughs> regressive left or, you know, all of these other issues. I actually wanted to talk about the big ideas. And and uh, I've noticed that the more, a lot of us over here are, you know, th there are people who try to pull us into these more sort of petty Jerry Springer-like uh, conversations. And I, I think it would serve us best to just ignore it. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm doing my best to do oh, that. I, and I, I know I'm saying that, especially after what happened last week. So, um, with me as well. Once in a while, you know. You well, what? Choice, but. Once in a while, I think you have to do it, and you have to have. Look, had all of this terrible stuff and all of the slandering and all this stuff not happened, then I think the awakening. You know, let's say you were awake probably before I was. I mean, my real awakening to this literally was that that night watching real time with that Affleck thing. So, had it not happened, I may have been slumbering through you know, the left going further and further to the left. So in a weird way, it is actually very empowering. Um, but I, that's actually a perfect segue to what I want to talk about next, which you're touching upon, which is that by not dealing with this in an honest fashion, by not really allowing the people to speak about it, the liberals to speak about it in a fair way, you're handing this to Trump. And we're seeing this. We're seeing this right now in America. We're seeing this in Europe, uh, where 
for the first time ever in places like Sweden and Denmark, far right parties are running on anti-immigration because it's all wrapped up in, well, we're afraid to be called racist. So it's crazy, right? Yeah, they're, they're all, everybody's Islamophobia phobic. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, they, have, they have the fear of being called Islamophobic. And um, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. We did, in a way, hand this to Trump. Um, the, the problem over here is that there's, Trump is not actually responsible for all of this anti-Muslim hate and all this anti-Muslim sentiment that's happening. So let's be clear on that. The, the, the party that's responsible for that is the attackers, the, the ISIS, the people who attacked Paris, the people who are making all these videos of, of beheadings of you know journalists and so on. I mean, these are the people uh, that the Americans and Westerners in general are reacting to. Right. But wait, but, let me stop you there, because what would you say to my friends on the left who would say, well, it's America that created ISIS? Well, uh, America, there. it's obviously a complicated thing. You know, U.S. foreign policy, uh, there's U.S. foreign policy, there's nationalism, there's greed, there's power, there's, you know, corporatocracy and all these other characters that people talk about, racism and misogyny. And people tell me, like, you know, why do you always pick on religion when you have all of these factors? And I, I always turn around and I tell them, I'm like, I agree with you. Religion belongs right up there in the same category with racism and greed and misogyny and, uh, you know, t terrible things that everybody else is doing. So I do think that U.S. foreign policy is a factor. And uh, the argument has never been that uh, religion is the only cause or religious sentiment is the only cause. We're not asking people to uh, recognize or, or to think that it's not everything else, it's religion. We're just saying the only thing that we're going against is the idea that it's everything but religion, to, to ignore the religious aspect of it or the fact that beliefs actually have consequences. Yeah. Yes, because we want to respect it. So, uh, yeah, the, so what I was saying earlier is that what Donald Trump is doing is that there is a lot of confusion, there's a lot of fear that a lot of people have right now legitimately. Uh, the way that you channel that, the way that leaders channel that is what makes all the difference. You know, so Donald Trump has basically fed off of it He's drummed it up more for his own opportunistic, opportunistic purposes, and he's turned it into let's ban all Muslims. Um, if there was another reasonable voice, you know, on, on the left, and they had channeled that and they had kind of um, responsibly dealt with it in an honest way, um, then we may see a different outcome. Right? When, when people are confused, that's when leadership matters. And that's where the liberals, I think, failed. So that, that's interesting. Now, naturally, I, I agree with that premise, but I think it, you could really take it to the candidates themselves. So, for example, Bernie Sanders, who I like a lot, obviously, and Hillary, uh, when you take the candidates that are on the left, that are the Democrats, when they won't say Islamic extremism or they won't say violent jihad or whatever, whatever the term you want, you know, everyone gets so caught up in terms that I, I hate even using words at this point. Yeah. But when they won't even say the terms and they'll just say religious extremism or something, I think that that they also then hand it to Trump because Trump's just giving you he's just giving you the, the wide, you know, the wide net to go with. And yeah. they're and they're still playing the games of political correctness. No, but that's exactly, that, I completely agree with you. And that, that is kind of what I was trying to say is that they do it. So there, there are two things that have to be done right now. One is that the rights of Muslims have to be protected. And number two, Islamic doctrine has to be challenged and criticized. Both of those things have to be done. What the, what the Hillary Clinton, the Bernie Sanders uh, uh, side is doing is uh, they're trying to protect all the rights of Muslims without actually challenging the ideology. And what the Donald Trump on the right, what these people are doing is that they're um, challenging the ideology without protecting the rights of the people. Yeah. So, yeah. And and it's not and and people think that that's contradictory. It's not contradictory at all. This is what I think it was Voltaire who said, right? Like I I will I may despise what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say. It. It's the same principle, um, and it's not that difficult to do if we have a responsible leader who actually does that. I think that that is something that a lot of people would relate to and they would understand that, okay, we will challenge the doctrine and a lot of Muslims, they'll get hurt. Like, you know, you're challenging my religion. This is my identity because people incorporate their uh, beliefs into their identity. And the dialogue would be, well, yes, you're a person. We respect your right to believe what you believe. But, you know, these are ideas. Ideas are different. We're talking about the ideas. We're not talking about you as a person. Right.
so that if the, if there was a political party that was running, uh, you know, that said we're going to throw gays off roofs and we're going to stone women and kill apostates, you'd probably be against that political party. But as a religion, yep. as a religious doctrine, it gets a little extra credit or something. That's that's the thing. Like, there's a lot of uh, it completely. Uh, it would be like completely strange things that we do. For example, neonatal circumcision. Like, infant circumcision is one of those things where. You know, we, I mean, my parents did it, uh, you know, my siblings have done it, like to their nephews and so on. It's a very, it's legal, you know, everybody does it. But when you really think about it, if there was, okay, if there was no religion behind it, or as I like to say, if Abraham didn't, wasn't so fond of dickheads, yeah. it, you would, th this would be child abuse. You'd have pediatricians getting sued for this. All right, so I, I, so I want to circle back a little bit to the beginning of the conversation and, and your history and your story for a second, because you identify as an atheist Muslim, is that correct? Well, atheist Muslim is the title of my book. Doctrinally, I, I, it can't be an atheist Muslim. The, the whole point of the book is uh, to talk about the incorporation of religion into identity. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, I mean, what, so I'll explain it this way. When I first came here, um, two years after I permanently moved to, permanently moved to Canada, um, is when the 9/11 attacks happened, and uh, when that happened, I, you know, I had this whole conversation in my head. You know, I was part of a Muslim family. I grew up with Muslim people. I, it, it, I was in the, all the Muslim traditions. Uh, the, uh, the Ramadan. You know, the, a lot of things are cultural. They're reasonably cultural, but there's some sort of Muslim things uh, like sure, Eid sure. and like Ramadan and so on. And too, so that was all a part of me. But at the same time, I wasn't a huge fan of the ideology. Um, so when I, when I came here, the 9-11 attacks happened, this whole conversation that had been going on in my head for a very long time uh, suddenly exploded. It was all uh, you know, on, on TV, it was on the radio, it was everywhere. And there were two sides to it. There was sort of the, the, the liberal side, and they said that you know, Muslims must be protected as a minority. So any criticism of Islam is bigotry. And on the right, it was that, and this is the, sort of the Fox News narrative, uh, was that you know uh, Islam is a sort of an, it's a it's a it's a violent religion, so Muslims you know we need to profile everybody you know we need to clamp down on immigration you know all of those things, and there was one mistake both of them were doing is they were conflating the ideology with the people mm -hmm. they were conflating the ideology with the identity, and this I, and this is where I wish for actually a middle ground and I, I think what we're seeing we're seeing the same thing with the regressive left on one side and you know the the Donald Trump phenomenon on the other is the same thing as a conflation of this uh, sort of ideology and um, people thing and by people I mean people who are a Muslim, Muslim just because it's as a birth identity because most people are Muslim because it's just a birth identity right so right. so for you personally while you're obviously an atheist so you're a non-believer uh, mm -hmm. Do you are you culturally Muslim? Like, what does that actually mean to you at this point? Like, I assume your family probably does some holiday stuff. Maybe you don't believe in it, but do you culturally identify that way? If me, for example, I, I'm an atheist. I am a, not a believer, but there are Jewish traditions that my family, that my grandparents did, that their grandparents did, that their grandparents did, that my family does. So I can do that, and I and it doesn't have a religious connotation. It has a cultural connotation to me. Right, that's that's exactly what it is. I mean, I enjoy. Now, I enjoy the feast of Ramadan. Ramadan's a great time. I mean, you you have people fasting. I, I don't necessarily fast, but you know, I'm there for the. <laughs> That's a bit much. The fasting. Breaking, you know. fast, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I like the Eid celebrations. I like you know I have little nieces and nephews, and they all dress up, and you know I get them gifts, and, and so I enjoy that as much as anybody. I'm on you know I I'm very close to my family, my nuclear family, and my extended family, and a lot of them are believing Muslims, so I do take part in that. Um, but there's also another place where it affects you. For instance, I read a story about this uh, kid who was called, who was beat up at school, and because, uh, and they said that, you know, she was an ISIS baby or an ISIS kid. And yeah, I, I saw this. thought of my niece. And um, I don't want my niece to go through that. I did like this whole thing that's happening in the U.S. right now. You know, I don't, I don't want my, and I've got, I've got nieces and nephews in the U.S. too. And, you know, so I don't want them to go through that. It would be completely heartbreaking. I'd be devastated if I heard that uh, my own niece went through something like that just because uh, she has a Muslim name, you know, a Muslim-sounding name. Mm -hmm. She looks a certain way. So 
it affects you at that level too. So when things like that happen, or you know, I, I recently I recently posted about this. I have a friend who's a, who's a physician. Uh, he's and he actually he, he's in California and he went to a party recently and there was a woman who came up to him and said, you know, you uh, she called him a Taliban terrorist and so on, and she was a little drunk. Uh, and fortunately, the people that he was around uh, jumped in and, you know, they defended him and they, they called her out on it. But uh, these are things that are ha- – and he's also an atheist, by the way. So uh, he's uh, from a Muslim background. And, you know, so when things like this happen, this is something that could happen to me as well. It could happen to my own family. Mm-hmm. So on that level, I do identify with uh, the sort of, you know, what a lot of Muslims are going through. On the other hand, I also get uh, prejudice. I mean, I guess apostates get it from not only the people who target Muslims, but the Muslims who target uh, apostates. Uh, so it's a bit of a double whammy there. But you, you, so you do relate to it, and this—it's a very complicated thing when you have that mixture of ideology and identity. Yeah, is it? It's a very complicated thing to navigate, and it's not as binary and as simple as you know what you hear. Uh, when you hear someone like Glenn Greenwell talk about it or someone like Donald Trump talk about it, who I think are sort of very similar. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's why I phrased the question the way I did, because I don't see an inherent uh, contradiction there. I I think that everything that you've described sounds completely feasible to me. And And if anything, it's not just feasible, it sounds preferable to me because you're taking the logical... And the uh, and the secular side of your of your existence, and fully acknowledging that, and then also acknowledging your your history and your family and all that. So that to me that to me makes full sense, and more people should be trying to do that. Yeah, I think uh, there is a uh, F- Philip Zuckerman is this uh, he's this uh, writer who wrote a book called uh, I think it's called Living the Secular Life. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. And in that he actually talks about secularizing religion. Uh, himself and I, I he also did an interview with Sam Harris Sam Harris interviewed him for his blog and he talks about that as a, as a very sort of seminal step in moving towards secularism is that you know you take you take the holidays you take the rituals you take the the community aspect of it mm-hmm. you know, how they have Sunday assemblies and everything um, so th- those are examples of uh, things that uh, people can do and how you know religions actually move towards secularism and he talked about reform Judaism um, which was which is interesting because you know J- Judaism and Islam again very similar you know how God revealed the Quran directly to Muhammad in the same way God supposedly revealed uh, the Torah to um, uh, uh, to Moses at the Tabernacle in Mount Sinai and so on and it was considered the literal word of God it was actually considered the blueprint for creation in Genesis at one point so it, it was meant to even predate creation and that's how it was thought of at a time and then in the you know late, late 18th I think it was the uh, it was the 19th century early 19th century uh, when the reform Judaism movement really took hold and it it got demoted from literal word of God to divinely inspired yeah right? so suddenly something was you know written by the hands of human beings and um, revelation became a progressive thing mm-hmm. you know so there was, there was equality uh, they adopted a lot of secular values and so on and and it changed so when people say, well, the Quran is infallible, you know, how are you going to change it? And I, I always think the, the Quran, there's precedent for that. There's actually precedent for that with Judaism, uh, with Catholicism, for instance. I mean, there's a lot of Catholics who are pro-choice. A lot of them practice birth control. Many of them, they fornicate to their heart's content. But, <laughs> you know, you, they, they still go and they observe Lent and they celebrate Christmas and Easter. And nobody kicks them out of the church saying, you know, well, you're not a Catholic. Yeah. Well- yeah. yeah. Well, for the record, I, I told this to Peter last week, but I actually went to Mount Sinai in 1997. I went to, to Egypt. I went to Sinai. I hiked the mountain and literally nothing happened. I asked. I mean, I really did. I was at that place in life, you know, 20 or 21 or so or 19. And I, I went there trying to have something and talk to somebody and, and nobody nobody talked back. Bad experience the first time. You don't want to repeat it again. I you, think. you don't. All right. So I, I want to end with this because you have brought up a phrase uh, that I think you've hashtagged. And I want to make sure that when this thing takes off, that you're fully credited for it. And hopefully I'll have a little something to do with it. But you've talked about the new center. And mm-hmm. I think it's, it's the right phrase for what we've been looking for. I think it fits. 
it fits because we have this left-right paradigm, but it also fits the center of this liberal split between, you know, the regressives and the, say, classic liberals. So can you just tell me a little bit more about what you think the new center is and what we can all do to, to get people there? I think, well, it's basically what I described here, that, you know, when you have the, when it comes to purely this aspect of Islamism and jihadism and, and sort of religious uh, extremism, if you say, even though that's a misnomer, um, it's, it's about uh, separating ideology from identity. It's about uh, being able to stand up for the rights of people, but at the same time challenge ideas. When you attack and challenge ideas, that's how societies move forward. Uh, if you attack and debase people, that's what splits people up. That's what actually rips us apart. So uh, being able to do, uh, to, to make that distinction is very important. I don't think either side is doing it. I think that the center is more rational. And on a, on, on a broader level, too, I've always found it bizarre that, you know, if you're fiscally conservative, uh, then, you know, you suddenly, you have to be pro-life. Right. <laughs> you, why does all of that go together? I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, people should be able to, you know, have different, uh, you know, I should be able to think that, okay, I believe in these fiscally conservative principles. Sure. At the sure. same time, I'm socially liberal, or I could have libertarian principles. I mean, there's no rational... I, I don't think you can be a rationally thinking person and be aligned with one side or the other. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's a whole other topic, figuring out how the, the politicians figured out to make everything a wedge issue. So somehow gay rights, if you were for gay rights, you were also for, you know, low taxes. Like, it just doesn't make yeah. any sense. Um, yeah. Do you think there's any chance for a, a political movement with that? Because the, when you, I saw it, you did hashtag New Center, and I thought maybe there's politics there, not just... Not just this sort of internal uh, discussion that we'll all have and hopefully get it out there more, but actually this could maybe be a political movement. I would, I would like that. And that's why I brought up the whole fiscally conservative, socially liberal thing is because, um, I, you know, when, it, when I grew up, you know, on TV, you had the, uh, the 6 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news. And, you know, you saw everybody watch that, whether you were liberal or conservative. I mean, 1984, when Ronald Reagan won, I mean, he won California. He won 49 states out of 50. Um, I, I'm not endorsing Ronald Reagan or saying anything <laughs> against him either. Uh, but I, what I'm saying is that things weren't as polarized. And then later on, you had 24-hour cable news. So you had Fox News on one side and MSNBC on the other. And everybody just watched what their own echo chamber was. I mean, every, every channel had its own echo chamber. With the blogosphere and with the Internet, that became even more... Uh, pronounced. So there's a lot of polarization, and I think it's getting to a point, and we're seeing this with the regressive left, uh, left and the Trumpian right. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that there is uh, that kind of polarization is something that a lot of reasonable, rational uh, people are not feeling. It's not working for them. Uh, they're actually frustrated by it. And I really hope that they do, uh, they're okay to let go of the traditional left and right labels because I they're practically meaningless right now. I don't think they mean anything. Uh, and uh, really just be human beings, thinking human beings. I love that. Uh, a, perfect a perfect ending. And I love the fact that we've connected. And you'll always have an ally over here. So next time, hopefully, we can do this yeah. in person <laughs> uh, when you make it out to Los Angeles. So I want to thank Ali Rizvi. His book comes out next year. But in the meantime, you can follow his regressive smackdowns on Twitter. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.